Hello and welcome to the third episode of the Budo Jake podcast. On today's show, we've got a doozy for you. I've been friends with Eric Paulson for a long time, but I haven't had a chance to speak with them for about five years. And uh, today's conversation is very wide ranging. We cover a number of topics such as the early days of MMA, why not to have sex before a fight, Eric's spirituality, and here's where it gets interesting. Uh, Eric also talks about reading auras, and uh, I stop him mid-interview and ask him to read my aura. And I don't feel like I expressed my <laughs> amazement uh, properly at the during the recording, but let me just tell you now, I was amazed at what he saw. And uh, part of the reason I didn't really express much excitement about it I didn't want to give off too many clues. You know, you know, when you have guys that are trying to tell you something metaphysical, sometimes they'll feed off of your cues. So I kept it kind of low key, but inside I'm like, wow, how did you know that? So, uh, it, it doesn't make for great audio because Eric is just looking around at my, at my aura and trying to decipher it. But what he says is spot on and I'll just, and I'll spoil it right now. Uh, he, uh, deciphered that I have injuries on my left side. I've injured my left finger, left knee, left elbow, all in the last six weeks. And I never talked about that beforehand, but he saw it. So that was pretty amazing. We also talk about UFOs and aliens. Uh, those are things that are in the news a lot lately as Congress uh, is getting ready to supposedly release more information. So Eric shares his opinion on that. Um, he also talks about how he reconciles being a spiritual person while teaching fighting. And lastly, he gives a little bit of advice for the MMA student. So I think you're going to enjoy this one. Eric is a brilliant guy. Uh, he's been involved in the martial arts for a long time. He fought in Japan. Uh, he did an MMA event uh, here as well in the U.S. He teaches a number of different arts, including catch wrestling, uh, striking, Kali, Jeet Kune Do. He is just a wealth of knowledge when it comes to martial arts. And uh, we cover a little bit about that. And uh, as you heard, lots of other topics. So get ready for a good one here. Now, before we get uh, into this episode, I'd like to ask you if you are practicing martial arts, if you're a, a student of whether it's jiu-jitsu or judo or wrestling, any kind of fighting art, head on over to budovideos.com where we have a large selection of instructional videos, both on on-demand format and DVD. We also have a, a lot of books, both new and pre-owned. And if you're looking for training gear, we have geese, rash guards, shorts, and kettlebells. And we ship all these products, uh, for the most part, worldwide. Use coupon code BJPODCAST to save 10%. Once again, that's BJPODCAST to save 10%. All right, let's get into it now with Eric Paulson. Eric, it's good to be back in your gym and, and chatting with you. It's been a while. How long? Uh, Maybe, five years. Probably. Probably. Yeah. Five years. In the meantime, you've gotten your seventh degree black belt in in Gracie Jiu Jitsu and uh your you've relocated your shop. Yep. And you've come out with tons of new of new DVDs and other lines of equipment. That's right. That's right. So you've stayed in contact very well and I've always enjoyed chatting with you over the years you know when i started martial arts back in the uh, 80s Late, um early 1900s yeah uh you know you were you've been active for so many decades in in the sport and you were doing mma before it was even called mma yeah that's well you're right it was called nhb mm -hmm. or volley tudo or shoot boxing uh shoot boxing was another league like shoot wrestling was a league and shoot boxing was a league and some called it shoot fighting. Shoot fighting, right. But the shoot fighting was, so there was about six different other leagues that were in Japan that mm -hmm. had MMA style fighting, but they were either predetermined matches. There were some works in there. Yeah. And shooto was the only league in Japan at its time that was all 100% real. Mm -hmm. And there was no rope escape. There was no carrying somebody if they had an, it came in with an injury. Like the first thing I learned from Shudo was 
when people walk in, the first thing you do is you look at their ears, you look at their shape, you stand next to them to see how long their arms are. And then you also look to see if they have a knee brace, an elbow brace, or an ankle brace. Mm -hmm. And those are the bullseyes. Yeah. And that's how the fighters were. Now, in Pancrase, my friend went in because he had a hurt knee, uh, Larry Papadopoulos, and he told somebody he was going against, either Guy Metzger or, or Ken Shamrock, he said, hey, I hurt my knee last week. He goes, don't worry, I got you. So, like, stuff like that, like, you mm -hmm. could... These guys would carry each other, so so they were allowed allowed to uh, compete every month. Whereas in Shudo, you know, you, I was getting fights every six months or every three to four months, and I even told Shudo that I'd like to fight three to four times a year if possible, mm -hmm. six times if possible, and they they were so surprised. They're like, "Oh, really? We had no idea." And uh, some of the other leagues, you're, they allowed you to fight more because it didn't matter if you had an injury. And also, some of the fighters would carry some of the fighters. Right. But you had rings, UWF, mm -hmm. Pancrase. You had uh, Saw, Submission Arts Wrestling. Yep. Later on, you had Pride. Yep. But these are some events that, again, we, we weren't allowed to compete or cross over if we we're an official shooto fighter because... A lot of the matches that they created or, or had uh, in the, these leagues were not 100% real. Right. Some were. Yeah. They had, I mean, I'm not saying there's not tough guys in each league. Babalu fought in, in rings. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of works in that. Pancrase, there were works in Pancrase. Some people will argue with me, but I know because I wasn't allowed to fight in Pancrase because I asked if I could. Right. And some, they just said it was the rope escape. Which they deemed as as part of pro the pro wrestling style because it it prolonged the match. Right. Like Shudo was absolute. If you got caught, you couldn't grab a rope. To, you're like you tap or or it breaks or or you go to sleep or whatever. For sure. So when you think back on your MMA career, do you think did you enjoy fighting more or coaching more? I definitely enjoyed fighting more. Uh, unfortunately, I started. When I was 26, I started fighting at 28, and it just I, I got I got started late in the game, but it was early in the game. Like mm -hmm. 1993 was my first fight, right? My first professional fight in Japan, and I thought I was going to fight a a three round three minute amateur, and next thing you know, I got a three five minute pro fight. Those guys are loud. Yeah, you got a, a good crowd here. That's great to see the, the school thriving. It's the kids. Yeah. The kids yeah. are the future. Yeah. So you say you, you missed your, your uh, you like fighting better than coaching. But when I think about the odds of being a successful fighter and making a lot of money, it seems so slim compared to the risk. What do you say to people when they walk through the door? Like, do you think it's a wise proposition to... Train MMA and, and try to make a, a life out of it, considering the potential brain damage and other injuries? Yeah, I, well, I don't think the brain damage is an issue. Uh, it's, it's really not because all the – if you're a boxer, I would say yes. A kickboxer, yes. MMA, the, the, the strikes are located – throughout your whole body so it's not just headshots so you're taking body shots slams um ground and pound here and there but you're not really getting hit unless you're really focusing on the boxing aspect you're not getting hit that much in the head unless your defense sucks mm -hmm. if you have bad defense then you're going to get hurt in any sport that you're going to do right. as far as pugilism is concerned but i think that that's for me it was never that until later on because I had a boxing coach I had a kickboxing coach I had tons of sparring partners we never wore headgear it wasn't until later some of the guys were so aggressive that we put headgear on a guy and guess what the headgear was for protect the hands so you don't get cut to prevent okay. cuts because of the diving headbutts and the mm -hmm. clashes and crashes when somebody's shooting and you drop your head to stop them, 
that's where all the cuts were appearing. And so I had to have one person put headgear on. And usually it wasn't the fighter that wanted to put it on. It was the all the people that were going in to spar with them, all mm -hmm. the sparring partners. Right. In boxing, it's different. They put headgear on both guys. But, you know, I, I got worse concussions with headgear on than I did without. Really? And I, I'm going to say that's because you have limited eyesight. Mm, and you're, if all you got to do when someone's got headgear on is just throw hooks. Mm. <laughs> right. That's a good point. Because you can't see my hands out here. Right. Uh, so everybody knows you for your martial arts knowledge. You've been doing this for a long time. When you think back, what was your most memorable time? Was it under a certain coach or a certain art? Uh, I think it was the first time we went to Japan. It was 1993, and we had been training in Shudo since 88 and really fight training since 1990 and then it was 1993 we finally got a fight and and i had been abstinent believe that abstinent right and training for this for for almost like six to eight months for this fight you were absent for eight months uh six months okay wow yeah I mean, to the point where, you know, if you've ever been abstinent before, like abstinent, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you have the old nocturnal emission, which mm -hmm. is, uh, it happens when you're an athlete and you're training really hard because your libido and everything's at record highs, your testosterone's at record highs. And then when you ab abstain completely from any sexual activity whatsoever, um, it, it not only makes you mad and frustrated, but, you know, just I think it makes you more susceptible to some some pretty provocative dreams. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something that fighters have been talking about for a long time. The Gracies have talked about it. Do you know it. what it is, though? I found out later on. So I had a, an acupuncturist that would always talk about kidney energy, kidney energy. Everything was based off your kidneys. And I said, so what affects your kidneys? What are the functions or what are the results of, uh, of renal failure or whatever? He said, first of all, your neck gets extremely tight. So that leads to knockouts, mm -hmm. tight neck. Your scalenes dry and tighten up. Secondly, it affects your kidneys, affect your knees. Mm -hmm. So... He said, if you don't have sex, it strengthens your kidney functions. With strong kidney functions, your knees are strong, your back is strong, and your neck is strong. And it's, it was, he was, this, my Chinese doctor said, when, when you have an orgasm, it affects your kidney functions, get weak, your knees get weak. And again, you might be susceptible to being knocked out unless you have an unbelievable chin. So I said, so it was the orgasm or it was the orgasm. He said, yes, that's what made, that's what made the kidneys weak, which in turn would weaken your knees. And that was the whole theory behind the, the uh, no sex thing. Okay. And also you want to be angry. Right. You know, you, you become kind of complacent when you're, when you have sex, you know, you're relaxed. You don't want to kick someone's ass. Right. You know, you're not feisty. I mean, I told all my fighters, I go, hey, please do me a favor. Don't have sex. Right. I, as much as you want to, don't have sex before your fight. Right. You'll lose your edge. Your, your anger, your aggression, your competitive edge kind of. Now, some people want to argue with me. Um, again, I was in I was in Abu Dhabi uh, in in Sao Paulo, mm -hmm. and my my roommate was a Purdue wrestler, and he had to go out and and had to go to the brothel and and hook up, and 
and uh, have sex with a girl. He said, I have to just to relax. I, I always have to have an orgasm before I have a match just so I'm relaxed. And I'm like, that's a lot of information. But <laughs> I mean, I go, why? He goes, because it relaxes me. He goes, oh, don't you know anything? He goes, most, most wrestlers uh, on the bus ride to the meet uh, whack off in a sock. <laughs> I was okay. like, what? <laughs> like, what? Really? I had no idea. But thanks for telling me. Uh, uh, like, I needed to know that. Glad I became a jiu-jitsu guy and not a wrestler. Oh, yeah, was, <laughs> I was kind of like, it was really weird. Like, he would say stuff like that. And it just, uh, how would I know? I never knew. He was a collegiate wrestler from, from Purdue. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so some people... That's what they thrive, or that's what they need. Personally, I wanted as much strength and aggression as I could get. Mm -hmm. So I, I had a feeling that sex was one way. Lack of sex is one way to make you edgy, a hundred percent. Because I was mean. I could have beat anybody my my day of my fight. Mm -hmm. My teammate who fought with me was bragging about having sex the night before we left with his girlfriend. And I was like, well, that's weird because I had a bartend at a bar. I had to work till 4, till 4 a.m. in a smoke-ridden bar mm -hmm. to make tips, and I still didn't pay, pay rent this month. And, and yet you're getting a free ride to UCLA or USC. You're getting a free ride to USC. You're at home screwing your girlfriend, and uh, I'm in a smoke-ridden bar, mm -hmm. you know, working my ass off not having sex, so I'm angry, and now I have to cut weight for my fight, and you're sitting in front of me at a Japanese Denny, Denny's eating rice and whatever you want to eat. And he's like, man, this this yogurt parfait is so delicious, <laughs> and these scrambled eggs with bacon, and I'm just sitting there just going, somebody's got to pay for this. <laughs> right. And that was my first fight in yeah. Japan, and, and I, I truly would attest to the fact that being abstinent, and dieting together uh, will make you a monster. Mm -hmm. Thanks, yeah, that's a great lesson. Eric, a lot of people, everybody knows your long history in MMA, but few people know about your spirituality. And I look around this room we're in at your gym and I see crystals and um, I smell incense. And so I'm just curious, what role does spirituality play in your life? Mm, so spirituality does play a big part of my life because we are more than just mental and physical creatures. We actually have tons of power and um, I believe in a higher power uh, being God. Um, since I was a little kid, my mom spanked me and I was just old enough to talk and she, as she was spanking me, I yelled at her and I pointed at her and I said, stop. And she goes, what? I said, stop. God's watching you. <laughs> and she was like, what? you can barely talk. Where did that come from? <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. So as, since I was a little kid, I always knew that, that there was a higher power or God or source creator. So... That's the religious, or is that spirituality? Spirituality is different than religion. Religion is you you uh, pray all the time. Uh, I, I pray, I meditate, but my prayers are are more. There's there's different forms of prayer. My prayers are more for people who are sick. So I'll ask and I'll plead for people who have cancer. I'll plead for their life. I'll plead for their healing. So most of the time that I pray, it's always to help somebody else. Because I believe that in your last point of your life when you have cancer and you're in the hospital and you are dying, what's it, what's it gonna hurt to, to ask for some help? Sure. And uh, when I was a little kid, I used to always be able to see stuff and I never knew what it was, and I always figured everyone else could see stuff. So I think I surprised a lot of people when I was a little kid because uh, these these kids, they would tease me. In fourth grade, they came up to me and they said, hey, they go, uh, you know, your eyes are really weird. You look at us sometimes and you kind of creep us out a little bit. And I go, oh, 
wh why is that? And they go, well, we're going to call you Ghost from now on. So I was like, you're going to call me Ghost. Oh, great. Thanks. And I go, well, I feel bad for you. Not you, not you, but you. I feel bad for you. It's fourth grade on the playground. Right. And this girl goes, she goes, why do you feel bad for me? I go, because your grandma died. And she goes, what do you mean? I go, she goes, how do you know that? And I go, she's standing right behind you. <laughs> and they all started screaming and they took off running. But I saw her grandma standing behind her. Hmm. I don't know why. I mean, I, I don't know why or how. I just would see stuff like that. And then and then I can also I could also uh, touch people and know things by touching them. Uh, I, I worked I was a massage therapist for ten years and I worked on a ton of people and I had I'm going to say about a 98% success rate with everyone that I worked on, I would heal them. But the problem is I stopped doing it is because I would take whatever they had, any pain they had, I took it on me. Hmm. And I, I didn't understand. But every time I work on someone, they go, wow, I feel great. You fixed me. I go, oh, thank you. <laughs> but and then the next day, I'm like, man, my back's hurting. <laughs> I go, hey, where, where did you say you were hurting again? They're like, my lower back. I'm like, oh, <laughs> left or right side? They go, left. Yeah, <laughs> it's my left side. So sometimes I would take it. So, so for some reason, I had the ability to, to uh, when I was massaging a lot of people, I would take whatever pain or ailment they had and I would pull it on me. I had no idea that I could do that until later because I started getting sick because I was working on five people a day. And then all of a sudden, I, I didn't know how to release this crap I was pulling off people. And a lot of the crap I was pulling off people uh, were also attachments. And a lot of people don't know that. They're, they're learning it now, though. But uh, you get attachments. Attachments could be anything from a negative thought pattern to a spirit or an entity uh, or even a dagger or an ax or a spear or you know a negative thought that somebody has that they project to you, it goes on you or it goes in your field. And if your field has a little crack in it, because you have a field, it looks like that. That's what your field looks like. Mm -hmm. But what happens from smoking, from drinking, uh, when you're losing your, uh, your let's say your, your frequency gets low, if you eat a lot of meat, you, you lower your frequency. If you eat more vegetables and more live foods, uh, your vibrational frequency gets stronger. And it's it's what you ingest. It's what you put in your body. If you drink, a, take a lot of sugar, a lot of salt, a lot of caffeine. Uh, these are all little things that you could get a fracture in your protective egg that's around your body. And so when I was little, I could always see the egg around people. And I could tell... Like, I would look at somebody, and I could see the egg around them, and then I would see it on one side. It would be a little dim and weak. And I said, hey, uh, what happened to your left shoulder? And they're like, what do you mean? I go, you you hurt your shoulder somehow. And they go, how do you know? And I go, your energy on your left shoulder, is, it's weak. You, um, It's strong here. It's weak on that side. And they're like, what the hell? I don't know. I, I just saw the the etheric layer, which is your protective egg, and there's like five layers. We have five layers around us. We have five different layers, and one the first layer is your etheric layer, and then you have your spiritual and your cosmic and all uh, all these different layers of uh, energy fields around your field. And your whole objective is to try to get your field as big as possible. Uh, and the reason you want your field big is that's your protection. So I have to ask now, Eric, can you see my fields? Uh, mm, not against the green. If we were in there, I might be able to. If you go against a, that wall, I could look. Okay. Let's see. Do you want me to hold on to this still? Okay. Okay. Now I'm moving against the uh, the wall here. Yeah, you're a little tired. You, you're about that much on top of your head. I can't see so well in this. It's 
Sometimes I see, sometimes people are super shiny. If they're tired, their field uh, shrinks. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when you're tired and dehydrated, you're dehydrated too. You have like a, it's, it's dim on this side and it's brighter on this side. Does that mean there's an injury on this side? I don't know. No. I don't know, but it's for some reason on your on your left side, it's not as, it was weird that I said left, your left shoulder. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, did you hurt your neck or something? Not the neck, but oh. left elbow. Oh. So maybe that's what you're seeing. Well, sometimes your neck affects your hands and your elbows. Uh -huh. So like if your fingers go to sleep, when you wake up and your fingers are asleep, it's because you're boring and you need to wake them up. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's actually, if your fingers are asleep, it's because you have an impingement in your neck mm. and your neck affects your fingers. Mm -hmm. I know because one of my fighters threw my legs over my head and sprawled on me and, and my fingers on my left and right all went numb. Yeah, Yeah, they're all connected. And, and I found out later that I, through what had happened, I herniated a bunch of discs in my neck mm -hmm. from getting sprawled on with my, in a plow position. Yeah. Uh, what do they call that? What's a yoga position? Uh, plow pose. Oh, plow. Yeah. So imagine being in a plow mm -hmm. and me diving on you, but sprawling on you. Yeah, I would not like that. And if you try to shoulder roll, I did it too fast, so you couldn't shoulder roll, and and I went over the back of my head, and all my fingers went numb, mm -hmm. and then, oops, and then it was my only three fingers on both sides, and then I went to a chiropractor later to get fixed or to get worked on, and he, uh, he kept adjusting me. I was getting adjusted three times a week, and I was swearing my doctor's name in the middle of sleep. I wake up and go, God, mm -hmm. and I'd swear his name. And so I go, yeah, you know, there's so, you're hurting me. I'm waking up and I'm hurting. What's going on? So I went, I got an x-ray, nothing. Went and got an MRI. He goes, you have like four herniated discs in the back of your neck. Oh, geez. Which I had no, and I'm getting adjusted on them. Mm -hmm. And they're doing traction and uh, the famous million dollar roll, which is just the, mm -hmm. right? And so. I just quit getting adjustments. Yeah. And then that's, because my neck was injured, I got an infection in my neck, and it, the infection wrapped around my spinal cord, ate away my top two vertebrae, mm. and then it localized in my chest. Mm. So I told Tanya one morning, I said, hey, I woke up and I said, I'm having major problems breathing, and I said, I don't feel right. And she goes, well, maybe you're getting the flu or you're getting sick. We travel all the time. And I was like, well, oh, I just don't want to wake up dead the next day. <laughs> so I, it was in my chest and my throat. And the next day I woke up and I thought I had the flu. And it wasn't the flu. I was completely 100% septic. Hmm. I had a staph infection here. Here is wrapped around my spinal cord and it was making me hallucinate. Wow. And then I, I started... Uh, uh, seeing faces. I'd close my eyes and I'd see like, I would see a face, like 10 faces in like five seconds. It was like pop, 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 pop. And I was like, well, what the hell's going on? I had to turn the TV off. The energy was too strong. And I found out my whole body was septic because I had blockage from getting cranked and manipulated. And, you know, mm. I, I was getting neck crank. We used to have to hold bridges mm. and people used to have to sit on us. I mean, yeah. that was part of our training. Right. We had to flip flop back and forth on our heads all the time, and I was like, "What's a long? Excuse me. Um, yeah, what's the long term effect? Uh, is there anything bad that happens to you from doing this for an elongated period of time?" Yeah. And there's like, "Oh no, just a very strong neck." And I was like, "Okay, I'll just keep doing it." Yeah, I see pictures of all the old cast wrestlers doing all those bridges and guys standing on their necks. And we yeah. had we had to do all that. We had to do. We had to do um, back neck bridges, front neck bridges, side to side, which are good for strengthening. Yeah. And then we had to hold our bridge. And then and then if you're a shooter, you had to have two guys sit on you while Jeez. you're holding a bridge. Wow. Up on your head, mm -hmm. not on your hands. Right. And and I was like, you know what? This can't be good. Mm -hmm. So it was that. 
and then and then getting neck cranked every day and then getting choked I, uh, my throat was crushed also i had a flat throat jeez it wasn't even round it was flat you were enjoying the liquid diet for a while i suppose well the guy i was choking almost every day i would eat food and i would choke wow. and I would wake up and I would drink water and I would have to spit it out because I couldn't swallow it because my throat was closed. And so the doctor said, I went to a throat specialist and he looked at my throat and he goes, have you been in a, in a bad car accident? And I go, no, why? And he goes, your throat's flat. Mm, geez. You know what that's from? The short choke. Yeah. When I went to Scotland, I went with uh, Rick Young and we went out to a pasture to this old judo uh, class Billy Cusack uh, was a coach and he had uh, Mark Preston and they had all these top judo players out there like top in the world and you would never expect this little stone hut looked like a lawnmower shed mm. and then you walk in and there's big three foot throwing mats or two foot throwing mats and I was like wow that's a big mat they go, you'll see why because mm. their throws were so hard right but uh, so they go okay. Uh, let's let's do some newaza, and I was like, great. And the girl goes belly down. And she crosses her arms, but she's belly down. And I go, uh, is that how you start? And they go, yeah. But usually the advanced person starts down, turtle down, or or butterfly guard or something. And I go, oh, okay. And she was just belly down. And so I was trying to lift her head and slide in my choke to hit the Mount Dilly on the f figure four choke, mm -hmm. the rear naked choke. And I, I was fighting and fighting. I got my arm in and I was trying to get it. And he goes, what are you doing? And I go, what do you mean? He goes, haven't you ever grappled before? And I go, no, no, today's my first day. And he goes, yeah, you could tell. That's what he said. <laughs> and he goes, why would you try to do that choke? He goes, that you can't, that, he goes, that's, that's an ancient joke compared to what we do. And I go, well, could I see what you do? Mm. And nobody was doing that over here. Right. And so he just, he punched his knuckles behind my ear. Mm. He went, bap, 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 and then went, boom, and got his blade across my throat and mm. caught his thumb and then uh, ripped his wrist in, mm. down, and then up and just crushed my throat and Jeez. choked me. But it took one second. Right. And I said, what is that? He goes, that's called the short choke. And he said, the short choke, you use, I go, is that legal? And he goes, yeah, it's legal. And I go, well, I'm not gonna use the other choke. <laughs> yeah. I'm just gonna short choke. <laughs> yeah. So I went around the world teaching the short choke to everybody. Mm -hmm. from, from the time I learned it there, every time I would meet people, I said, hey, let me show you something. This is called the short choke. It's easier and it's faster. Mm -hmm. And then we learned all these different ways to open with a with the tricep on the temple and open them up, lifting the forehead, mm -hmm. punching, uh, cross face and lifting the nose and all these different ways to get in to get your arm in for the short choke. Mm -hmm. Well, I let everyone short choke me and I did a seminar for the Washington State Police. And I did a thing on tackle defense because they're all getting taken down and shot with their own weapons. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right, raise your hands. How many people here know how many times in a situation, an excursion, that there's a, there's a uh, how many times when you're in an excursion is there a lethal weapon involved? Uh, raise your hands, and if you know, keep your mouth shut. Raise your hand. And 10 people knew and 20 people didn't. And I was like, wow, you got 20 officers that don't know that there's always a lethal weapon in any excursion that you'll ever have because it's your own. Mm -hmm. And every officer was getting taken down and, and the guys were drawing their guns and shooting the police officers. Mm -hmm. They were the number one police force in all of the United States that was getting taken down and shot with their own weapon. Oh, wow. Guess what they attested it to? I don't know. They're allowing inmates to lift weights, mm -hmm. number one, aggression mm -hmm. number two they're allowing inmates to watch the ufc's oh wow and the, they were all practicing double leg tackles to take down and then weapon extraction so they had no weapon retention and those guys probably weren't having sex so they were really angry right <laughs> well it's prison so i mean if i was in there i wouldn't be but 
you know, some of those guys, you never know. Eric, yeah. let's, let's pivot for a second. We've talked uh, in the past about um, some conspiracy theories, and there's so many of them out there, and some that have been proven true, and some that still haven't been proven true, and some that are just totally wacky. But I'm curious, what do you think is the most believable conspiracy theory out there that you believe? That UFOs exist? There's a lot of talk about UFOs right now. They 100% exist. Um, Let me pause you for a second. Of course, UFOs exist, unidentified flying. There's things in the air that we don't know. They yeah. could be drones. It could be foreign military, our military. But are you referring to aliens or just things that we don't know? Extraterrestrials, that, um, they prefer to be called stellar beings. They don't even prefer to be called extraterrestrials. But, yeah, there's many different races from different uh, from different planets and different systems. Um I watched David Wilcock and Corey Good. Uh, I'm not sure if they are 100. percent Some people say they're compromised. Some people because they talk about the secret space program, how we're on Mars and we're on all these other planets and things. And then you got the flat Earth theory and the firmament theory that we have never been past our Van Allen belts. We've never visited the moon. And then I watched a thing last night, which is a new show that was talking about the moon actually being a uh, it's a base. And that people were living inside of it and they went in one of the moons i don't know if it's our moon but they went in one of the moons because there's many moons and many suns also mm -hmm. in all different multiverse galaxies right but they said that there's actually there were there was a two races of uh extraterrestrials that lived on mars and they were warring each other and when a meteor or something hit, it, it killed the sun and it killed the uh, uh, water supply. Uh -huh. And so they were, went inside. They were still battling. And, and then when they went in, uh, they had, I forget, they said like four, four ships or something like that. And they left Mars and then they inhabited the moon. Hmm. And they were inside the moon, living in the moon. And then... Uh, they were talking about these guys going inside the moon and there was all these different uh, screens and everything was like high tech, all this stuff, but they said it was so massive, but they said inside the moon it smelled because a lot of the people that were living there died. Mm. And so they left the moon because people, it wasn't uh, sustainable, mm -hmm. so they had to get off there and then they came to Earth and that's how uh, our this is like pre-Adamite uh, races came to Earth, two of them, elongated skulls. One of them had like a bulbous front, a skull, with, but kind of like a, a, a ball on the front here. Mm -hmm. And there were two, and that's why there's pyramids all over our Earth. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this guy was talking yesterday, and he, he said that nobody on Earth, as much as he has examined and studied the pyramids, and he was given numbers of pyramids in every country around the world and everywhere has pyramids are built everywhere. Right. And he said you have the two, which are the smooth pyramids like in Egypt, and then you have the ones that are in like Mexico and and South America that have the steps right. that are different. But that's because there were two races and, and then they came to an agreement that they would agree and they would inhabit, half of them would inhabit part of the earth and the other half would inhabit the other part. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how everything happened. And then also uh, the reptilian situation, which, which uh, we were created, human beings were created as a slave race to, to mine gold. And we were also, they're living off of us as their food supply our blood and also our emotions and our hate and our uh, fear. Okay. It's called, well, it's called Lush. Okay. Wow. There's a lot there. So with the COVID relief act, we're supposed to, uh, the Congress is supposed to release a ton of information on UFOs next month. Why do you think now, why, why are they going to release all the information now? And, and do you think they really will release all that information? It already has been released. I know because I follow a bunch of different, uh, People during the the COVID lockdown was a good time to start digging, and you could watch a shitty Netflix movie. You watch ninety percent of it, 
and then you get to the end, and you're like, what the? I just wasted two hours. <laughs> I could have watched a stupid documentary that might have been half real because it, you know, it's entertainment. Right. So of course, of course, there's. I, I was at. Of course, some of it's fake. I was at a, actually at the movie theater. I went and watched the movie Noah. It was in the movie theaters, and I wanted to see because I thought it'd be a good movie. And so they show everything was cool, but it's entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. So there was these two pastors that came in and they were sitting in front of me watching. And they're like, "Oh, this is all. Oh my God, the timelines. Oh, that's not that's not right. Oh," and they got disgusted that it wasn't uh, real or or they're like, "Oh, this isn't factual. Blasphemous. Oh, blasphemy." And I'm laughing, just going. And they got up and they're walking. Around. I go, hey, hey, it's a movie. It's <laughs> entertainment. It's supposed to be fake, <laughs> but half of it's real. Right. Everything has truth in it, yeah. but but there's disinformation. Unfortunately, there's a group of people that are out there right now that are that are causing. Uh, they're, they're what they're doing is they're going in, they're hacking sites, and they're putting disinformation or misinformation out to get people that follow that like like the q q mm. people uh they want to follow something and then they'll put misinformation out and they'll give it to them and and so what it's doing is dividing it's easy to divide people when you're when you're looking at stuff or taking it as truth and then you're repeating it right that so the whole fact check thing came out i mean look how many fact checkers are there you need fact checkers for the fact checkers. Who's fact checking the fact checkers? That's that's the, that's the problem because half the fact fact checkers, more than half, have a political agenda. Sure. You know they're they're biased. Yeah. And so if it doesn't meet their narrative, then it might be uh, flagged as as false information or not true. Right. So, you know that's another thing you can't. Everyone's like, oh, I fact, yeah, I fact checked this. It's like, well, who do you fact check it with? Yeah. Snopes. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of the thing. But I think it's coming out now because and here's another theory and another thought. And I think you, everyone can feel it. But so the earth, there's supposed to be a big solar flare. And the solar flare is supposed to affect the earth. It's supposed to burn the earth, which can cause a flood or a meteorite hitting the earth. And... So from what I've been told, they say the second coming of Jesus or the second coming or Jesus come back, king, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I, I've seen and read a bunch of stuff. Uh, they're saying that it might be Christ consciousness. Christ consciousness is shifting into the fifth dimension. We're in the third dimension on earth here. Mm -hmm. Fourth dimension is like the sleep state, and then, and that's where you could deal with good and bad things, entities. The theta level is a fifth dimension, which is and sixth dimension is pure love, mm -hmm. and we're trying. Uh, Earth is trying to shift into the fifth dimension, and for us to shift, then we could be at a frequency where the extraterrestrials can come in and be a part. They're already part of us. They're all, we're all, I mean, there's a lot of people here that I think are from other planets and, and from, or, you know, I think that's possible. I think we might have uh, DNA or, or uh, some things from maybe another planet. Just, you know, I've met some people that I could swear that are aliens. <laughs> I mean, I know you have. <laughs> yeah. Do you think they come in peace or, or do you think? Yeah, they yeah. You don't yes, think they caught, they want any harm? You know, I think there are a few dark ones, but the dark ones are all being shut down. The dark ones, because their agenda is all selfish. Mm -hmm. It's not for betterment of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, my whole thing is I want the betterment for humanity. So whatever is good for everybody, I'm, I'm all for that. When something is self-serving and about themselves and about harming people, uh, I'm not into that whatsoever. So let me ask you this, Eric. How do you reconcile being a spiritual guy and wanting what's best for people, not causing harm, and teaching people how to break pe people's bones and choke them unconscious? Well, first of all, I grew up being bullied. I had an older brother, and he had his older friends, and they would always beat up the younger kids. 
all the time. And I was one of those kids, and I, I despised it. I was like, you know, why can't we all just hang out and laugh and have fun and, and play games? Why, why do you guys have to hold us down and pound on our chest and, you know, uh, give us wedgies and, and uh, pour water on us when we're sleeping and try to make us pee and, you know, whatever. And that happened regularly, and I was like, you know what? There's got to be a way to stop all this uh, uh, mistreatment of people and people bullying people and teaming up. And I, I, I remember these kids rode by us on their bikes, and they were a couple years older than us. And this kid hocked a loogie and spit it, and it, he just got done eating one of those uh, orange push-ups. Right. And it, like, slid across my face. And my friend was with me, and I go, hi, you missed. <laughs> and then I was, Arr! and they both turned around, and he goes, what did you say? And I go, you missed, as I wipe my face, you know. Mm -hmm. And here my buddy's like, oh, shit. And he runs and he hides in the bush behind me. So I was just standing there. I go, he goes, what did you say again? I said, you missed. And the guy goes, hold him. And his buddy held me, and he punched me in the face as hard as he could. And then I, I, <laughs> I looked right at him, and I go, that doesn't hurt. And then, he, <laughs> and then he wound up again. He hit me as hard as he could. That's how I knew I had a good chin. Right. This is for like third or fourth grade. And then and then all of a sudden, he hit me twice. And I said, I told you it didn't hurt. And then, and then they got together, and then they started to take off. And I was so angry and just like fuming because my buddy was hiding in the bushes. Didn't help me out. Mm. We should have fought. We should have at least got our asses kicked. But he hid and let me get my ass kicked or punch my face punched in by these two creeps right and and ever since then i was like i hate bullies i think i think for empowerment you got to learn martial arts you got to learn self-defense you got to learn how to defend yourself uh if you like the way you look like if you like the way your face looks you need to learn how to defend your your face mm -hmm. you need to learn how to box so you don't get your face punched in yeah you need to learn a wall survival drill so you can defend against somebody punching your face in learn how to body lock and take down uh and like i said the reason i learned neck cranks and i liked them so much is because i had people doing wrong things to me mm -hmm. and i don't want to choke someone out you put someone to sleep and you can't you can't uh get instant gratification but when you neck crank someone they scream really loud and you could still crank them right and so the neck cranks and things like that for me or a standing achilles lock on a civilian mm -hmm. is great because they scream <laughs> especially if they're a runner because right. their calves are all tight you put yeah. an achilles lock and you stand up with it and you right. just bounce yeah but stuff like that like that's how i verify or credify the fact that I learned martial arts and and that I've actually um, learned as much as I could about martial arts, uh, all different arts, not just not just one, but mm -hmm. striking weapons as much as you possibly can, guns. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was little, I studied ninjutsu because mm -hmm. I did, I wanted to be remain invisible. Yeah, that was a big thing in the eighties. <laughs> it sure was. <laughs> uh, it was actually. I was a tree and a boulder several times after we egged cars mm -hmm. or strung cars. <laughs> right. And then uh, just stuff like that. But as far as like that, that's my reason behind it. And also, I'd like to defend people. Like when I see someone getting their ass kicked. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the first guy to go run and jump in and, and pull guys off people all the time. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the best things I ever learned, because I, I was a bartender in, in Manhattan Beach, and a lot of guys down in South Bay were learning jujitsu, mm -hmm. and they get in street fights, and they're like, hey, help, help, there's, there's a guy, he's beating the shit out of my boyfriend, and my boyfriend can't do anything, help. So I'd run out there. And the guy was on top of the guy, and the guy, he was punching his face, and the guy rolled to his belly, and then he put a rear naked choke. And he was holding the guy, and he was out cold. And I go, hey, he's out cold. Let him go. And he kept holding him. And I was like, I counted 10 seconds. I'm like, he's going to kill this guy. Mm -hmm. So I put a rear choke on the guy, choking the guy. Mm -hmm. And then he let him go, and then I put him out. And then, and, and then it was funny because 
it was that, learning to choke the choker, uh, that's an easy way to pull someone off of somebody. Mm. And then I also learned how to wake up a narcoleptic. Mm. Uh, there's a, where your horseshoe is on your tricep. Right. You pinch at the tip of that, and it wakes somebody right up. Oh, wow. Because I used to have guys fall asleep in my bar. Mm -hmm. I go, last call, they sleep, and, they, and I walked over, and I go, hey, has he had too much to drink? And they go, no, no, he's narcoleptic. Mm. He, he'll wake up when he's ready. And I go, well, we're locking the doors. He's got to go now. And they go, well, you can't wake him up. And I go, yeah, he can. So I walked over, and I pinched <laughs> And he goes, yo! He jumped up. And they go, what did you do? And I go, you pinched the horseshoe. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, that's good to know. And now when he falls asleep, we can wake him up. Mm -hmm. but, that's some good information I'll file away. I don't know if I'll yeah, ever need the it. the tricep. Yeah, okay. So where were we? We're in the, oh. So <laughs> we were on the airplane last week. And this guy was in business class. And he had a skateboard. He was acting really weird. And I, I, I walked up. I was getting out the airplane, and he was like laying. He was unconscious. So I was like, "Hey, wake up!" I go, We're, "We landed," and I was shaking him. And I go, "Is he okay?" And they go, "Yeah." And I, was, "Is he drunk?" I don't know what's wrong with him. And uh, uh, I go, "Is he a narcoleptic? He mm -hmm. might be narcoleptic. He might you know they fall asleep and you got to wake him up." Mm -hmm. So. I, I touched his shoulder when he was leaned over and I touched his shoulder and uh, I went down to his tricep to, to feel and to shake him a little and I was going to pinch his tricep to wake him up and I slid down a little bit and the bottom half of his arm wasn't there. <laughs> and Tanya's like, Eric, what are you doing? And I was like, uh, I'm trying to wake him up because... Everyone's trying to get off the airplane. He was laying sideways, and his mm. skateboard was hanging out. I mean, everyone's walking and bumping his head. So I was trying to do a service to the, to him and the airline, and I <laughs> I, got, he, I didn't know he was missing a half of an arm. Right. And, and I tried. To, I was going to pinch his tricep when I felt his his uh, nub. Yeah, his nub. I I felt really bad and. I didn't pinch him. Right. And Tanya just drugged me off the shoes. Let's go. But, uh, you know, I think that's good to know how to wake somebody up. You pinch your tricep. You'll never know when you'll need that information. That's right. I mean, this is the only place to probably get it. Well. <laughs> Eric, one last question for you. Let's circle back to, to martial arts. You know, a lot of people think they want to train MMA. They watch UFC and they think, I want to do that. And they, they don't realize how hard it is and how much getting hit in the face sucks. You're here training MMA guys all the time. So can you end this? podcast with some advice to the real MMA, MMA student some some pros or cons um, yeah well if you're not going to put yourself in 100% there's no sense in even attempting MMA unless you just want to try to fight and just see what it is but if you are trying to make a career out of it and you have the option to go to college go to college train get good finish your degree I get some people there, they're like, oh, I'm going to just fight. It's like fighting's short-lived, and the window of opportunity lasts for l literally a blip of time, and you're in and you're out. Yeah. I mean, I I remember I, I tried to hang on as long as I could. I fought until I was 42 years old. I had five fights lined up when I was 42 years old. I was ready to go to another league and another league and another league, and they all fell fell through mm. all of them mm. for me at, at 42 i use that as a sign because you get signs all the time mm -hmm. and it was a sign for me to say hey i think you're done fighting there's a reason why five fights fell through not not two right five the universe was saying you're done yeah and, and here was the other thing uh when i fought on hdnet I fought Jeff Ford, and I won in a minute and 44 seconds. I arm bar, hit a spinning arm bar in four seconds. I was ready to – I was all excited. I was like, wow, I, I hope that performance was good enough. And then I stand up, and they raise my hand, and this guy goes, kill him, Grandpa. And I go, and this is where I re-retire. Mm -hmm. And I said, nobody's ever called me Grandpa, so I guess I'm a Grandpa now. Mm -hmm. I'm not even a Grandpa, but I guess – 
I'm the age of a grandpa, so, and then I, that, I just realized, I go, nobody wants to watch old people fight. Because mm. I was going to start a league, and the league was going to be all old fighters are going to all refight each other. Right. I was going to bring in Chemo and Tank and, mm -hmm. and all these guys, Shamrock, and try to get uh, Oleg Tatarov, right. Marco Huas. It would have been fun. Somebody, well, I thought, I thought, yeah, that would be fun. And then someone said, that wouldn't be fun to watch. And I was like, they go, you better have uh, good insurance. Yeah. <laughs> because of the, the heart attack issue. Yeah, and we just saw Jacare this past weekend. Poor guy. You know, it's. Jacare is the best grappler in the world. <sighs> Incredible. And then this guy said before the fight, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit him. Mm -hmm. And then he broke his arm, right? Yeah. Second time it's happened to him. Once wow. in ADCC with Roger Gracie. Wow. Oh yeah, yeah. He, but that he he didn't let, he didn't tap. He didn't tap. No. That's right. Yeah, he's trying to be like Jesus. Yeah. yeah. But uh, as far as MMA, uh, if you want to fight, have a couple smokers, mm -hmm. do some amateur fights. The camo we started the camo league for that purpose, yeah. so you could get experience. The problem is, is everyone's seen all these people on TV and they want to be like Conor McGregor, right? So they go, I want to turn pro. It's like, but you're not ready. You don't even have a, well, we have a guy that wants to join our team and he wrestled and I go, you don't have submission or striking. You can't join our team because you're going to be a punching bag for a year. Right. And I said, I, I don't want you to get hurt. I want you to learn some martial arts after a year and then I'll throw you in fight practice. Makes sense. If you really want to do it. But if you do, how far do you want to go? Like, right. do you want to fight in King of the Cage and Gladiator Challenge? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to make it to the big leagues? Because if you want to make it to the big leagues, you better start running right now. <laughs> right. You know, and that's the thing. If, if you're not that serious that you could sacrifice everything and be poor mm -hmm. and be broken and show up to practice five days a week, don't join fight practice. <sighs> and uh, unless you just want to do a smoker and, mm -hmm. and you've got a real job. I, I have a few guys that... Most of our fighters, they all live at home with their mm -hmm. with their parents, which is smart. Yep. I would have, if I could have been a fighter living at home with my, with my mother, mm -hmm. and and helped her with rent, that would have been great. You wouldn't but have I, to be at the bar waking up narcoleptics. That's that's right. I wouldn't have to have been bartending till four in the morning. Yeah. To a bunch of smokers. Eric, thank you for the advice. Thanks for your time today. It's always great to catch up with you. I'm glad to see you're doing well. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Talk to you. Thanks, later. guys. Well, I promised you a, a wild and wide-ranging show, and I hope I delivered. Hope you enjoyed that episode with Eric Paulson. Um, stay tuned for another episode. I'm not on a strict schedule, but I do want to release these maybe once every uh, one to two weeks. And I will probably be doing uh, episodes on a variety of different martial arts uh, with interesting personalities to keep things a little different. So I'm not always going to be covering jiu-jitsu topics. If there's anybody you'd like to see me interview, leave a note in the, uh, leave a YouTube comment. I, uh, I take a look at those comments every once in a while, so I'll see what you type there. All right, guys, thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time on the Budo Jake Podcast.